Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Continetti, the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a discussion of the new biography, Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. Born on July 31st, 1912, to Jewish immigrants from Russia, Milton Friedman may well have been the most influential intellectual of the 20th century. His accomplishments, not only in the field of empirical economics, but public policy, as well as public communication, are legendary. And it's a great honor to welcome Jennifer Burns here to talk about her uh, definitive work of the life of this extraordinary individual. Jennifer Burns is an associate professor of history at Stanford University and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, where she works at the intersection of intellectual, political, and cultural history with a particular interest in ideas about the state, markets, and capitalism, and how all of these play out in policy and politics. Professor Burns has published widely, including in the New Republic and the New York Times, and is the author of uh, another excellent biography, Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right. And I hope we can touch on the connections between her two subjects at some point in the conversation. So Jennifer, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming out today. Making the trip to the East Coast. That's right. Always happy to do it. Um, I <clears throat> want to talk a little bit about the book and especially kind of introduce the audience to some of the key concepts that informed Friedman's economics. But maybe the place to start is with the title, The Last yes. Conservative. <laughs> and when we think of Milton Friedman, we often don't think of the phrase conservative maybe classical liberal or libertarian. So how did you come up, or how did you arrive at this particular title? Yeah, I have to say I've definitely gotten a lot of flack about this title, but that's okay. Um, Friedman did not sit down and write an essay like F.A. Hayek did, said, why I am not a conservative. So I felt like I could get away with it. Um, but there's some substance behind that. So one part is thinking about him as an economist. And what I learned in the course of my research, what really distinguished Friedman is he took up ideas and methodologies and approaches that the rest of his field considered passe, retrograde, old-fashioned. An example of this would be the quantity theory of money and said, you know, I think there's something to this. Let's keep working with this idea or let's keep doing the research the way we've done it. Um, let's not, you know, fall for what he might have called the siren song of mathematics in economics. And so in that way, he was someone who conserved these older approaches to economics. Secondly, I just use it very practically and, and pragmatically and not philosophically. Freeman was in alliance with and deeply influential upon a political movement and political leaders who took the name, the word conservative, to describe themselves. And so American conservatism is different than conservatism in other countries in that it incorporates this kind of libertarian um, uh, uh, ethos, this pro-capitalist ethos that in other countries is often called liberalism. It's too confusing in the United States to call it liberalism. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a pragmatic choice. It has to do with the language we use. And in terms of the last, I mean, I kind of throw that question out to the readers. You know, I think the synthesis that Friedman represented um, is at the very least less common. Uh, the type of conservatism that drew together free market economics, uh, really global orientation towards the rest of the world, um, and traditional values. I think this synthesis is maybe up for grabs, maybe falling apart. And so I thought that it would be useful to think of Friedman as representative of a political moment that has passed in some important ways. You know, it's interesting um, that you point out that unlike F.A. Hayek, who wrote his essay, Why I Am Not a Conservative, Friedman never really took an oppositional attitude toward how he was described, right? He, he comes across in the book as someone very interested in coalition building. Yeah, I think that's right. And so it wouldn't necessarily have benefited him to have a big dispute about the type of name he wanted to be called by. And sometimes he was very pragmatic and said, I'm working with Republicans and conservatives because they're the closest I can get. Um, but I think it wasn't just a marriage of convenience. I think there was a real connection and a real alliance there. Um, one can't think of Milton Friedman without thinking of the University of Chicago. And uh, while I loved the entire book, I was really drawn to Friedman's experiences at Chicago uh, as a young graduate student uh, 
and his experience with what you might call the first Chicago School of Economics. And you list a variety of figures there, from Frank Knight to Jacob Viner, uh, and most importantly, probably uh, Henry Simons. What was his um, what was his takeaway from his Chicago education? It seems like he got a lot of the concepts he then introduced into the body politic from those formative years at Chicago. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I that was so fascinating. I almost just could have done the whole book about that part <laughs> of Friedman. And it's not necessarily the Friedman we know because it's much earlier in time. So he came in the middle of the Great Depression, actually really the worst year, 1932, and he encountered a, a, bo a body of economic thinking and several inspiring economic figures who did think of themselves as classical liberals. This is before the word liberalism had been redefined and, and linked to the New Deal coalition. And they were really thinking in terms of economics, they were thinking of themselves in opposition to institutional economics, which was concerned with social reform and economic planning. And they knew that wasn't, um, that wasn't what they considered the right economic approach. But they also were really in a crisis, a global crisis of democratic capitalism. So uh, you have the rise of fascism in Europe, in Asia, you have the Great Depression spreading around the globe. And they felt like we are classical liberals. We have these ideas of limited government and of market allocation and market efficiency, but we can't at this moment in time, it's no longer gonna work to stand up and say, um, well, we're really in favor of limited government and sorry, this is happening. We have to come up with some new formulation of liberalism that holds onto the principles, but recognizes we're in an era of mass democracy and we're also in a huge economic crisis and how do we address it? So I think that's really what Friedman got, this idea that free market economics, let's call it, could be, as he said it, progressive and positive. It could be something that solved problems. Um, it could be something that engaged with issues of the day, not just a kind of reactionary, well, we don't have anything to say because we're in favor of free markets and therefore that's the end of the story. So that's really what he took, um, especially from Henry Simons, who is this fascinating figure who then tragically dies midway through my book. Um, he basically, it, it looks like it's a suicide. And he is someone who's very influential on Friedman. He is more egalitarian than Friedman ever was, kind of intellectually and personally. Um, and he's also very much involved in like trying to reform the tax system and the monetary system. And so this is one of the could have been's. What if Simons had lived? How would he have Friedman and Friedman have related? What role would he have played? And instead, Friedman kind of grew up into the space left by Simons, but also recrafted Simons' ideas to sort of fit him better. You know, it's interesting that as much as Friedman was a defender of freedom, he did kind of understand, as you say, that you needed a positive Positive Program, which I think yes. was the title of Simon's, Simon's title, book, right? Positive Program for Laissez-Faire, and that really sums up what Friedman took. And while we'll talk about some of the other concepts as well, one um, concept that I think illustrates this concern that it can't simply just be negative, or of course this fixes, it fits in the title, but was Friedman's idea of the negative income tax, right? yeah. that there's, there's going to be something here that we're going to use to actually promote the welfare of the poor. Yeah, how could, how could, one, how, how could you find... Um, if you didn't believe in economic planning. Um, and I should say that he did support the early relief efforts in the Great Depression. So if you have mass unemployment, he's not saying don't do anything about it. He's definitely saying try to meet those people's needs. But on an ongoing basis, how would you design a welfare program that's compatible with the belief that market allocation um, is the best for society? And really, you should be as careful as you can about interfering in the price system. So this is where he comes up with the idea of the negative income tax, which he first frames as a guaranteed minimum income. Those are his words in the very first proposal he crafts for this, which is in 1939. And I found this document in the archive. I'm like, what's this? I'm like, who wrote this? Like, why is it here? And after a while, I dig around. I'm like, this is Friedman's first policy paper, 1939. And it's for basically a universal basic income. So that's very startling. But as I watched his thought, that really was core to his idea um, because his belief was, a sort of a cash grant or a guaranteed income, it would be counter-cyclical. So when your income, if the economy slowed down, more people would get this benefit. If the economy was doing well, fewer people would have it. And then the idea is that you wouldn't need to create a program or a bureaucracy. Um, you would kind of almost build this, you almost saw it as a type of a price. Like you give people an income and then they go into that price system, into that market system that they otherwise can't get into. So that's a really consistent through line. It only drops out of his thinking 
really in the 70s, which is when the EITC comes to pass, which I really think the basic model of the EITC is Friedman's legacy. And it goes back to this idea of like, how do we make a positive, how do we make laissez-faire be something positive um, or market thinking be something positive in terms of social programs? So, and I can say more about this. My theory is that after the EITC, his interests shift to education mm -hmm. as the method for dealing with poverty and inequality and mm -hmm. lack of opportunity. So they kind of, it kind of trades off at that point mm -hmm. in his career. That's a great point, too. Of course, both concepts are contained and explained in capitalism and freedom. Yes. Not to jump ahead in our story, yes. but it's interesting how, well, okay, I've accomplished this, so I'm going to move on to the next right. idea of education, freedom. He's got it choice. all. It's a very yes. well-rounded <laughs> system. <laughs> um, What's striking about the University of Chicago at this time is it's not just kind of the intellectual legacy he gets from his professors, but it's also the milieu in which he makes lifelong friends, indeed lifelong relations. So tell us about the directors and uh, yeah. their role in this fascinating story. Yeah, so the directors are a family like Friedman's, an immigrant family from uh, Eastern Europe. They settle in Portland, Oregon, and um, they have an older uh, son, Aaron Director, and then they have a younger daughter, Rose Director. When Rose Director goes to University of Chicago, first of all, it's rare for a woman to leave her, her, her parents don't want her to leave. She goes first to Reed College, then they say, okay, you can finish at the University of Chicago, and the reason they let her go, these very protective parents, is because her older brother is there. So he becomes kind of her surrogate parent, and so then she continues on to graduate school, also very unusual for a woman to continue to graduate school in economics. And her name is director, and students are seated very formally, alphabetically. So she ends up seated next to Milton Friedman, director Friedman, and Milton Friedman is not going to let this chance go to waste. She's like the only woman within miles because <laughs> there's not many of them in the graduate school. And so they become very close friends, and eventually they become a couple. And so then now the director and Friedman families have sort of merged, and Aaron Director is a close friend of you know, Friedman's as well, Milton Friedman's as well. And he's just always kind of in the circle. Director's best friend is Henry Simons. George Stigler is in the mix. Actually, Paul Samuelson is in the mix for a little bit. And then he goes off to Harvard and kind of finds the Keynesian path more appealing. Um, but And what I found is they, they took over this storeroom in the basement. They called it Room 7. So I talk about the Room 7 gang. And they basically moved into this space. They moved out the furniture. And this was like where they would hang out. And they would just have these kind of jam sessions and talk about economics and really made these lifelong bonds. Yeah, you know, when I do my own work, say, on the New York intellectuals in the 1930s, it's a similar um, dynamic at work. Is, are there any takeaways there? What creates a, an intellectual community uh, like these? Yeah, you're thinking Alcove 1 and Alcove exactly. 2. Yes, mm -hmm. Room 7 is like of a piece with that. Um, I think they're trying to find their professional paths. They're connecting personally. I think what's important or what's distinctive about Room 7, so I mentioned before that Knight and Simons <clears throat> do not think of themselves as institutional economics, which is really at a high tide coming into the Great Depression. And institutional economics is very linked to the progressive movement. Um, their watchword is social control, that economists um, and reformers should sort of control the development of society. Knight and Simons are opposed to all this. And Knight in particular feels like my truths are being overrun. Classical liberalism is in danger. Good economics is in danger. And he's kind of a dark and woe is me guy. So it creates in them the sense that like they are keepers of the flame. Like mm -hmm. they have this knowledge that they must keep. Um, and it's very much, if you look at the you know, sociologists analyze the founders of a new school of thought, and there's often like a charismatic leader and then the kind of followers who cluster. And this is very much like that. The other thing that's important about Chicago we haven't quite touched on is they have a tradition of monetary economics, of thinking about um, whether it's the quantity theory or the banking system. Um, and that is how they approach the problem of the Great Depression. And so it also gives Friedman a lens into what is happening. This question of like, why did we fall into this depression is he gets an answer for that as well. So they have an explanation for the crisis they're living through. They have a mission to promote this set of ideas that will otherwise be lost. They have a leader, Frank Knight and Henry Simons, who they admire, and they have all their best friends with them. So that is so formative. I mean, Friedman's thought does change and shift and evolve, but it is also set in like a fundamental pattern in those years. Now, I've heard that you uh, deliver a talk at times 
with the title, Milton Friedman Was a Woman. Yes. Um, give us the shorter version of uh, that talk. I wish it was more exciting. I wish I had discovered something truly exciting. Um, <laughs> but I think it's actually pretty exciting. Okay, so Milton Friedman was not a woman. I didn't, didn't come up with any you know, uh, amazing revelation there. But what I mean by that is so the, the first woman in his life was uh, Rose Director, who became Rose Friedman. And she was unique for her time in being a fully trained economist. She didn't get the PhD, but she came almost to it. And so um, through her, Friedman stayed in touch with this whole world of women economists. And most of them were doing consumption research. They were doing a different type of research than the men who were on the tenure track, who were increasingly moving towards mathematical approaches, kind of top-down modeling. These women were sort of left out in the cold, and they were busy studying what actually happens in an economy. Why do people buy and sell? Because consumption economics was seen as something that women could safely do because they knew all about shopping, right? So, so here they are in this world, and Friedman is connected into the questions and problems they're coming up with. So one of his major works is a theory of the consumption function, and this starts as a paper that Rose writes with her best friend, then Friedman, then they're corresponding about it, and Friedman kind of like gets into the correspondence and was like, well, here's what I think. It starts to be conversations in their summer house, and the next thing you know, it turns into this book. And actually, what I discovered was Friedman was trying to get um, two of his friends' jobs at the University of Chicago. He's trying to get Dorothy Brady and Margaret Reed, two of the women economists in this conversation. He wanted to get them hired at the University of Chicago, so he took their ideas and he wrote up a long memo to say to his colleagues, here's all the great ideas they're having. One of them got hired, and then that memo grew into a manuscript and grew into a book. So that's a theory of a consumption function. Now, Friedman, you know, people who know Friedman know that a, theory, a monetary history of the United States is co-authored with Anna Schwartz. So there's book number one, now we have book number two, Capitalism and Freedom, is with the assistance of Rose uh, uh, Director Friedman and really if she hadn't been there, the book wouldn't have happened because Friedman was really busy and Rose came in and put all his things together. And also originally Aaron Director was gonna write this type of a book and he really didn't get to it. So eventually his sister was like, well, I, I can make this happen. Mm -hmm. And so these are like the three major pillars of Friedman's thought and the, each of them are co-authored with a woman. So if you took that person out of the picture, we'd have somebody left, we'd have a, a good economist left. I'm not sure we'd have a great economist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one thing that uh, came out, uh, especially in this early period, and then later on um, in the story as well, is uh, Milton Friedman was an internationalist. He was concerned about the fate of other countries, and he thought that America should play a leading role in world affairs. And that kind of struck me as slightly askew from what the positions one often associates, say, with libertarianism. Um, explain that and, and where, the, where that idea that um, you know, foreign affairs and national security are an important part of his worldview came from. So I think it really came from the context of World War II. Um, his identity as a Jewish American, he was very aware of and concerned with the Holocaust. And then also, the tradition of isolationism in the American conservative movement, which he identified with anti-Semitism, and he thought these were really tied together. And so one thing I found is throughout his career, he always has someone who he's trying to sort of push against and kind of put himself in their place as a representative conservative thinker. And in the 1950s, he, he's talking to his friend about, he calls it the McCormick-McCarthy wing of the Republican Party. And so... Um, that's McCarthy, who we know, and McCormick is Robert McCormick, the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, who Friedman is aware of because he lives in Chicago. And he thinks rightly that he's anti-Semitic, he's isolationist. And so those voices need to be pushed out. So when you see someone like William F. Buckley come along, who is committed to fighting anti-Semitism, who's also very internationally oriented, um, that's, that's the alliance he wants to make. Now, he is skeptical about as time goes on, foreign aid programs, for sure. But compared to the conservatives of his day, so we think of someone like Henry Hazlitt, um, who goes on a crusade against the Marshall Plan and basically gets nowhere. Um, so Friedman's not in that place. Over time, he's kind of unclear about how much, he's worried about the perverse incentives of foreign aid, and then he also wants a more deregulated international economic system. He wants floating exchange rates. 
but he, he feels that the turning from the world is often linked to these other kind of darker sides of conservatism that he's very concerned about. And I guess it kind of relates to his idea that ultimately it needs to be a positive program, right? You right. can't just turn inward or be negative. Um, among the figures, so you mentioned kind of the figures on the right politically who he's kind of thinking about and reacting against. Major intellectual figure, it seems to me, that he spends a lot of his earlier career poking holes in is John Maynard Keynes. And mm -hmm. what I loved about your book is how you drew a distinction between the thought of John Maynard Keynes, the genius, and then the thought of his kind of American acolytes who turned Keynes into Keynesianism. And it seems like Friedman was really arguing with Keynesianism, uh, even while having some respect for the master. Was it, could you explain how this American Keynesianism came to being and how Friedman uh, kind of demolished it? Yeah, there's a great quote where um, Keynes comes to DC and goes to a dinner um, with a bunch of economists and he comes back to London and he say, says to his friend, I was the only non-Keynesian there. Yeah. <laughs> and so he started to perceive that disjuncture. It's another one of these could have been, I think Keynes dies in the same year that Henry Simons does, you know, really in the middle of his career, so we don't know what would have happened. But then he's not there to say, no, I didn't mean this, or I want to go in this other direction. Um, a couple things happen. Um, one is I think the Keynesians are um, a little, have a, want to have a heavier hand um, in terms of economic activity. So a clear example of this would be they favor price controls um, to, to manage the wartime economy, and Keynes does not. And so that's like one just really clear distinction. Um, another would be that American Keynesianism gets very um, wedded to new, more mathematical approaches to economics. We think of economics as like a quantitative discipline today, and if you try to study it today, you'll have to make your way through a lot of required quantitative classes before you get anywhere. It was much more, sometimes I think Friedman is also the last political economist. He's the last person who writes books, um, who's really engaging these kind of broader questions of state markets um, and their interrelationship. And in an idiom that like, you can still pick up a monetary history today and read it, like from the first page to the last page. It's not inaccessible. But the field is going much more professional, um, much more uh, numbers-based. And in part, this is because of their role in policy. Um, with the growth of this state during World War II and the end of the Depression, there's now, first, economists have a place in a policymaking apparatus they didn't have before. Um, and there's a new sense that the government needs to manage aggregate demand. Well, how is it going to manage it? How is it going to know what to do? Economists need to provide numbers. Um, they can't just kind of come to Congress and say, well, here's what I think. They have to say, like, my analysis shows X, Y, Z. So they become more and more interested in numbers. And so Friedman just objects on so many different levels. One is um, that he doesn't favor the amount of state intervention that the Keynesians do. The other is almost, I would say, philosophical or epistemological. He doesn't think you can know as much about the economy and about the impacts of specific policies as the Keynesians do. And this really comes out in the 60s when the, the, the word is fine-tuning, that economic policymakers can fine-tune the economy by making little adjustments here and there, a little program here, a little grant here, a tax raise here. And Freeman just thinks you don't actually know what's gonna happen. It's a, comple it's a complex system and you're gonna make an intervention and that's gonna kind of cascade out in all sorts of ways that aren't predictable. So let's just step back and, and try to have a lighter hand. I mean, it's amazing kind of run of economic work because but when you add up the theory of the consumption function with the, uh, quantity theory of money and then the work in a monetary history with his, then with his speech uh, as president of the American Economics Association yeah. where he attacks the Phillips curve and kind of predicts that w we would experience stagflation in the 1970s, um, he, he kind of kicks out the foundations yeah, of one that, at time. one at a time of that Keynesianism that he was arguing against uh, and aware of from a very early age. Was that, did your research suggest that he knew he was doing that or was it simply one project led to another and the cumulative effect was kind of disinterring an entire school of economics? I mean, I think he must, he grasped the kind of system and the way it held together in a very clear way. Mm -hmm. And I think he was skeptical. 
Um, but I don't know that he had the evidence he needed to make that case early. And, and how he came to money is very mysterious. So he's hired at Chicago as sort of a statistician, as sort of a math guy. That's really where he makes his mark. He publishes some early papers. He's involved in um, some high-level statistical research for the wartime statistical research group. And I've seen the debates over his hiring. This is who they think they're getting. They think they're getting the kind of wave of the future um, mathematical economist. And then he gets there and he's like, no, I don't want to teach mathematical economics. I want to teach money and banking. And it's like, why would you want to teach money and banking? There's nothing in his professional career to this point that would indicate he would be interested in that or have a competency in it. Um, and it's at that point that Arthur Burns says to him, so Burns is his longtime mentor and friend, um, and he's come to the head of the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is not in a good spot. And it needs to kind of be revitalized. And Burns has inherited this project on money from Wesley Mitchell. He's like, I want to study money. And then so Burns has this sort of mandate. He doesn't know what to do. And he taps Friedman. And he says, will you work together with my staffer, Anna Schwartz, on this money project? And Friedman's like, absolutely. That's really what I want to do. And so it's something about that. So it could be that he's understanding that money is the road to understanding the Great Depression. And the analysis of the Great Depression is really what has led to Keynesian economics. I think it's more of an intellectual interest in the beginning. And then I think once he gets going, he thinks, yeah, there's lots of problems here. Um, so now turning to the political half of the political economist, um, he, one of the things that makes Friedman stand out is that he had this uh, body of accomplished work in his field before he begins to turn to the more political questions in the area of um, uh, public policy and, and political communication. He writes Capitalism and Freedom in 1962, I believe it's mm -hmm. published, a collection of lectures, as you said, that um, Rose was key in actually making come uh, to being. But his real appearance on the national stage, to me anyway, is his association with Barry Goldwater in 1964. And, um, he somehow becomes the face of Barry Goldwater's economic program. Um, do you feel as though that he, he felt that he, that was the stage where he needed to make an impact and so it was time to turn the page? How did he get involved with the Goldwater campaign and what, was, what were some of his takeaways from it? Yeah, so let me say first he was offered a spot on Eisenhower's CEA uh, in like 54 by Arthur Burns, who was heading it. And he said, no, I've got to do my Chicago workshop. Like he, he had a new grant. He wanted, he wanted to focus on his academic work first. So he definitely felt like I need to establish myself in my field. Otherwise, I might get distracted. So then um, Capitalism and Freedom comes out. It kind of goes nowhere. A Monetary History comes out. It's huge. And, and that really kind of makes his name. And it's right when Goldwater is running. Now, he actually tried to connect to Goldwater earlier. I found this essay or this letter he sends Goldwater and he's like, dear, you know, Senator Goldwater is a fellow admirer of, or a fellow, you know, believer in free enterprise. I was very disappointed. Goldwater had supported capital controls. Um, this is the era when uh, the beginning of the weakening of Bretton Woods when gold is flowing out. And so there's a legislation to restrict the money. And so Friedman continues in this letter, um, you know, restricting currency. This is one of the main ways a state can dominate its citizens. And you have to hear in this the echo of Nazi Germany. Like, you know, if, you, if the state can say you can't leave with your money, it's really got you. And so Goldwater's like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, kind of, and so Freeman's like, oh, please, we can meet in Chicago, all this stuff. And he gets totally blown off by Chicago. I mean, sorry, by, um, by Goldwater. And then it's like a year and a half later, and all of a sudden Goldwater's like, oh, hello, Professor Friedman. <laughs> like, I would love to meet up with you anytime. And I'm like, what happened here? And I'm like, oh. Goldwater's thinking he's going to run for president. And he's like, oh, yeah, there's that Chicago economist guy who wanted to meet me. Maybe I should meet him. So, so there's some false starts. And then Goldwater loves a monetary history. And he gets right away the kind of sub-thesis, which is if a monetary history is right, we don't need to manage the economy in the way we have been. We just need to like focus on the money supply. He gets that right away. So then they, then they have these meetings. But Goldwater's campaign is not very well run. It's completely disorganized. It can't get a good statement out of his campaign team. And the media is like, who is this Goldwater guy? What does he stand for? And they find Milton Friedman, who's very quick on the draw, very articulate, um, and is identified as having some sort of relationship. Although you can see in the media, they're like, he's an advisor, we think. <laughs> Not because it's, it's, 
it's kind of a, an amateur effort, the Goldwater campaign. So at the end of the campaign, really, Goldwater kind of goes back to the workaday work of the Senate. And meanwhile, Friedman has become a media star because he's been the person who says what Goldwater stands for, really, in the media. It's funny because he's uh, Friedman's one of two careers that were launched in politics from the Goldwater campaign, the other being Ronald Reagan, who <laughs> came uh, right. on the national stage yes. in his October speech. Uh, the um, Goldwater didn't win, but Friedman then carried on several relationships with Republicans who did. And um, in some ways, uh, the Nixon administration was one where he was um, most plugged in uh, through the connection of Arthur Burns, his mentor, who becomes chairman of the Federal Reserve. What was, uh, what was Goldwater's, uh, or rather Friedman's, relationship with Nixon? Um, and uh, what was his eventual um, judgment on Nixon's economic yeah. policy? I, I would say the relationship was ambivalent and then ended up negative with yeah. Friedman not liking him. <laughs> and so he... I think he met Nixon a handful of times because one of his Chicago buddies, Room 7 guys, Alan Wallace, worked for Nixon, and they had been introduced. He thought Nixon was very smart, so he admired that. Um, but he, he never really saw Goldwater as a politician, but he definitely knew Nixon was a politician. And he felt distrustful of that, like, I can't be sure if this guy is straight with me. So the Arthur Burns story, that's, that's a whole nother story. The belief was that Arthur Burns, who had been his instructor at Rutgers and his like lifelong friend, would be would launch a Friedmanite Fed, and that's not what Arthur Burns did, and I have found some very, very passionate and angry letters between them in the archive. So, so what happens is Burns turns out not to be the kind of insider that Friedman thought he would be. And in fact, he and Burns come out on the opposite side of everything. Burns is the one who kills the family assistance plan, which is a version of Friedman's ideas. And instead, it's George Schultz that really emerges as Friedman's partner in the Nixon administration. And they had known each other in Chicago. Schultz was also a professor there, but in the business school. And they were just very simpatico. You know, Friedman had all the ideas. Schultz was the executor. Um, and so it's actually Schultz, when he gets fed up with Burns, so, so Friedman's, you know, shelling Burns with these, like, negative letters about how bad his policy is. And then he starts ceasing George Schultz. And I'm like, why is he ceasing George Schultz? Like, he's nothing to do with the Fed. But he's trying to use Schultz to kind of convey to Nixon that, like, I think Burns is doing it all wrong. And then when it comes to the breakdown of Bretton Woods, that's where they're really working together. And so basically, Schultz is calling Friedman, and now he's the head of the Treasury. So Schultz goes through many different, um, I think he starts as Labor Secretary, OMB, then he ends up at the Treasury. So now he's at Treasury. Bretton Woods is on its last legs. And Schultz is calling Friedman and saying, what should we do? And Friedman's saying, well, here's how we can craft it. And the memos are going back and forth. And then Schultz is coming in and telling his staff to do this and that. And one of his staff members is Paul Volcker, actually. And so it's really interesting to compare all their accounts because they're kind of, Friedman and Schultz are kind of setting up a system that looks one way, but it's going to work out. It's kind of like a, it's a way station. And Schultz kind of knows he's being a little bit snookered, but he can't quite figure out what's going on. Uh, sorry, Volcker knows he's being like kind of put upon. Anyhow, you can read it in the book, but it's interesting how, how Schultz becomes the channel of his influence in Nixon. And then, then comes the wage and price controls. And that's the real break for Friedman. And then he's kind of just counseling Schultz, like, yes, you should resign. It's OK that you're not resigning yet. And it takes Schultz another couple cycles of the like instantiation of wage and price controls before he finally does resign. I love the passage in Two Lucky People, the memoir he co-wrote with Rose, where he says that Nixon's wage and price controls were the worst thing that Nixon ever did, far surpassing Watergate. <laughs> uh, only Milton Friedman would write yeah. a sentence quite like that. A um, couple of other things from the 1970s. Uh, maybe the first is you, you open the... Um, chapter uh, where he receives his Nobel Prize in 1976 um, and with the disruption of the ceremony. And the disruption, of course, is related to uh, Friedman's associated with, uh, association with Chile and the um, Pinochet coup uh, against uh, Salvador Allende. Um, what was your takeaway from studying this episode uh, of the so-called Chicago Boys? and uh, their uh, influence on uh, the Chilean economic program? 
Yeah, I think my top line takeaway is it's more complicated than you think. And secondly, that Friedman played less, Friedman, Milton Friedman, the person, played much less of a role than has been generally understood or is widely understood. So, um, yeah, I found, um, so I, I try in the book to kind of pull back to the broader context of um, Chile's longstanding economic philosophy, which is import substitution, industrialization, which is protectionist. It's an effort to sort of grow the economy of um, nations that are not fully developed in order to they have their own industries and they're not subject to the like market forces in terms of the major export commodities they have. And so that's really the fundamental orientation of the universities, the government, the politicians, and the U.S. government funds a program to train Chilean economists in a different approach, which is the University of Chicago approach. So it trains, it's a hundred some, they go to Chicago for a while. Some of them study with Friedman. Only one, I think, is actual his, actually his advisee, but they're, they're imbibing the Chicago world in which Friedman is a central figure. Then they go back to Chile and they're complete oddballs. They're talking about lowering tariffs, um, taking off price controls, you know, free markets, all this stuff that just Chilean business, which you would think would be their natural constituency, are not at all interested in this because they have their relationships with the state. They have their relationships with the, the tariff is crafted so they can work with. They don't want any of this stuff. They don't actually want the kind of untrammeled competition, which is what Chicago, the, the Chicago boys are saying. And the Chicago boys is pejorative because they don't, they're not really important. They're oddballs and they all kind of cluster together and they write their economics papers. Um, and so Allende is elected and sort of shifts the, the political economy quite drastically and starts a widespread nationalization program, has very bad economic effects. Uh, he's overthrown by Pinochet, I think, after three years. And so, you know, the Chicago boys are part of the opposition to Allende, but they're not a particularly significant part of that opposition. Um, and when Allende is overthrown, inflation is 600% annual. So it's a, it's a, it's a, very, very bad case, not even, it's hyperinflation. And so the, the military gets it down to about 300% their year in, and they, they still have a big problem. And so that's when they start listening to the Chicago boys who say, we have a whole different way of doing this. We're gonna do basically everything we've been doing, we're gonna do the exact opposite. You know, you are protecting industries, we're gonna not protect them. Um, you know, we're gonna do all kinds of different things. And so when they start to make headway with the Pinochet regime is when they reach out to Friedman and say, can you come and explain our ideas and what we need to do? And so he comes and he's there for six days. He has an audience with Pinochet for about 45 minutes. From accounts of it, he says something like, if you liberalize, here's what you should do. Inflation is so bad, you have to do a shock treatment. You can't be slow. And in the United States, his approach, he's a gradualist because he wants inflation to come down slowly. He's actually He's trying for the soft landing in the United States. In Chile, he's like, we're in a different scenario. It's so bad, you have to do it really quick. Um, so he basically tells that to Pinochet, and then he says, if you liberalize the economy the way you're planning to, eventually you will have to liberalize the society. That will follow, because he believes there, that these freedoms are indivisible. Um, and then he has like a six-day visit, and I actually found a travel log where he records all his impressions of the visit. So that was really interesting, because... The, the Chilean press is censored and regulated, and you're not going to really know what he says. So the, there's, there's accounts of what he says, but they're not particularly accurate. So this gave me a kind of insider's view, unpublished view. And you can see that Friedman notices the military dictatorship, and but it's not front and center in his mind. Um, he's really thinking about the central bank problems, and he's noticing the soldiers have guns, but it's not... It's not front and center in his mind. So he's just, I think, saying this is the way things are down here, and oh well. Um, and so then he leaves the country, and the it, it, so the dictatorship, I don't want to minimize its harms in any way. People are shot, people are executed, and a large number of people are sent into forced exile. So there's a lot of Chileans throughout the world who are really watching what's happening in their country and are really horrified. And then Pinochet sends um, his goons out after Arnold Letelier, who was one of the exiles who'd been high in the... Um, government, and he's assassinated by a car bomb in D.C., probably not far from here. So this foreign government has killed an exile in the nation's capital. And then three weeks later, Friedman gets awarded the Nobel Prize. So this sequence of events makes it seem as if it, it sort of connects Friedman into the horrors of the regime, and it makes it seem like the people who hand out prizes in economics and things like this, 
think that Pinochet is fine or maybe even think that Pinochet is great and are favoring all that he's doing by or awarding Friedman the prize. So it really gets, this whole interpretation gets attached to it. Um, and that's still a very strong interpretation today. And I think a lot of times people believe that because they think that Friedman, in having met with Pinochet, had something like, like in the American context, if you work for a president on the Council of Economic Advisors, it's because you're aligned with that president's vision, more or less. You're a member of their political party. You want to support them. And so I think sometimes that's how it's interpreted. Like, oh, Friedman met with Pinochet. It must be because he's a supporter of the Pinochet regime. And I just think that's not the right paradigm to apply to an economist traveling the world during the Cold War and visiting other countries, because most of the time they went to countries where they thought the person was doing everything wrong. Um, and that's sort of what Friedman did. He said, you, this is what you need to change in your economic policy. Um, and so I think that I also, it's been interesting to, I get a lot of questions about this. And I think today we have, uh, we have an impression that you, um, if you object politically or ethically, um, the right way to telegraph that objection is to distance yourself and separate yourself as much as possible. And in this reading, for Friedman not to have separated himself definitively from the regime is tantamount to endorsement. And I don't think Friedman was thinking that way. I think he was realizing this country has a huge inflation problem. I'm like the world expert on inflation. I've been asked to give my advice. Of course I'll go and give my advice. And doesn't mean I endorse the military dictatorship and he didn't foresee that it would be read as a sort of tacit endorsement, his actually going to the country. So I think you, know, you can fault him for not speaking out more clearly. Um, I don't think the decision to go to the country on the face of it, it means it's an endorsement or means that it was like a, a morally flawed decision. Um, he probably could have framed it and explained it better and he ended up getting a huge amount of grief and really was heckled and followed and it turned out to be a very traumatic episode so by the 1980s, he's much more clear, and he actually will go back to Chile and really argue with some Chileans who are now saying, like, the dictatorship is great because it brought us capitalism. And he's like, no, 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 don't say that. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of a long answer, but this is a very, uh, it still brings up a lot of passion for people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still, it's important, I think, to understand what happened and then to think about, like, what was the right thing to have happened. Um, I have several more questions, but I hope to have the opportunity to call on the audience. Uh, at the end, um, as this is going on, he's awarded the Nobel Prize in economics. He's gone the distance from being kind of a fringe figure in the world of political economy and economics yeah. to now being Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate. And his public profile is increasing um, in the same decade between his column for Newsweek and then culminating in 1980 with Free to Choose. Um, the impact of that series in particular, I think, resonates today when one can easily find many clips of Milton Friedman arguing with people. It seems like he really enjoyed arguing with people. He did. <laughs> did you get that sense? Yeah, it's funny. His son actually recounted to me, he said, I was like a teenager before I realized there were forms of conversation other than argument. <laughs> because the house was just all argument. And they even had a number system. Um, much of which has been lost to the mists of time. But what does survive is, I think, number one meant um, you're right and I'm wrong. And so that was like a shorthand way of getting through, you know, a lot of conversation and argument. So, I mean, that thing, that, that series, it, it has its vintage charms. It's definitely worth looking up. It also, I had someone point this out to me in one of the first talks. They were like, this is amazing. You know, Friedman's sitting down and having a real argument with people with whom he disagrees. And it's not a gotcha and it's not mean-spirited. And in some of these, Friedman makes a very effective case. In others, he really doesn't. He sometimes gets pinned to the wall. And they were just saying, like, does this ever happen anymore? <laughs> like, do people ever publicly sit down and debate in an actual debate where they might lose with the camera running? So I commend it to you for that alone. Um, but it, there's also some great, there's some great hairstyles and ties and other things like that in it, too. <laughs> I forgot who it was who, who pointed out that um, if you're in an argument with Milton Friedman, you can't concede anything because as soon as you make your first concession, the battle has been lost. He will seize on that and then he'll just burrow and burrow and burrow until he's, he's won or overpowered you. Yeah, I mean, I think one, he, he had the happy warrior vibe. Mm -hmm. Very, very, so you could be sort of eviscerating you with a smile on his face. Um, and then the other thing that really distinguished him, especially in the economics profession at the time, which 
um, particularly in the early years in the more mathematical wing, had lots of European emigres. He has this mathematical facility and he's this incredible verbal facility. So he's never at a loss for words. And so other economists are scared of him because they can't pull it together fast enough. You know, they just, they can't, they're just not off the starting block fast enough. So yes, they start avoiding him um, for sure. I want to kind of turn toward the uh, last decades of his life. Um, so the string of Republican presidents who kind of, um, and certainly in Ronald Reagan's case, embrace Milton Friedman as this iconic figure. How were, how were his relationships with Ronald Reagan and then the two Bushes? So Reagan was a very warm relationship. They had met, um, I think they met in California when Reagan was the governor and they had you know, spent time together and sort of Friedman immediately really liked him. Um, and then, so Schultz came back into the um, administration and um, was part of the President's Economic Policy Advising Board. I think it was Schultz and Martin Anderson. You know, there was a group of economists that would regularly come to the White House, meet with Reagan, and by all accounts, um, Friedman was Reagan's favorite. And so the really important part came when um, Reagan was the president during the Volcker shock, when Paul Volcker really tightens monetary policy, interest rates go very high, a recession is caused. And there's enormous political blowback, and a lot of people are complaining about this. And um, Ronald Reagan has really digested Friedman's ideas. He, he used to kind of graph the money supply in the air you know, to his advisors, which was probably like a chart he saw in a monetary history of the United States. And he, he got the, the word from Friedman, just stay the course, stay the course. This is going to work. Let the medicine take effect. Let Volcker do his thing. So I think that was really, it gave Reagan ballast to just maintain central bank independence and let the policy work. And so um, that I think is really significant. And then they just got along very well. Um, by the time of the Bushes, he's older and less active and connected. Um, and apparently the big dispute between he and Rose in the last years of their life was that he did not favor the war in Iraq and Rose did. And so they had quite a bit of just friendly argumentation over this. And I think that's maybe the little bit of the last kind of libertarian uh, impulses coming out of Friedman in those later years. Um, a couple more things about that period toward toward the end. Um, I remember, I recall, um, I don't think I ever met him, but I recall him uh, in the last years of his life being very concerned about the level of government spending mm -hmm. under a Republican president. Was that a sign, uh, that was that another kind of point of departure he took from the last yeah, Bush? Yeah, it's, it's tough to say. So, so Friedman didn't believe deficits were inherently bad. He thought they were bad if they were inflated away. Um, but he also believed that Republicans would be fiscally responsible. And he believed, that, you know, especially during the Reagan era. And it took him a while to kind of figure out nobody's watching the store here. <laughs> both, both sides are, are, are running up the deficit. And so it, it's hard to say. He, he knew it wasn't a great sign. Mm -hmm. At the same time, by the end of his life, he really had shifted. And this started to happen with the Nixon administration. When Nixon came in, as a Republican and really expanded the scope of the federal government in many different ways, he decided, you know what, the sort of fundamental dynamic here is growth. The government grows, that's just what it does. And if we're ever gonna stop it, we have to push back with everything we have. So he didn't actually think um, that deficits were bad if they would eventually inhibit the mm -hmm. growth of the government, right? This is why he constantly wanted tax cuts. Mm -hmm. He said tax cuts are the only way we're going to potentially slow down the growth in government. And if they cause deficits, well, maybe eventually that will slow down the growth in government. So I think what he really wanted by the end of his life, probably government spending was probably 30% of GDP. He wanted to go to 10. That was his idea. This is like a pre-depression state, mm -hmm. you know, that he's interested in. So, um, you know, I think towards the end, he makes some compromises with, and he's part of that shift away from, balanced budgets being sacrosanct to not so much. And of course, he was a great supporter of um, Social Security reform, mm -hmm. right, which would have put him on the same side as George W. Bush. Um, let me ask you about China. Uh, there's a famous scene where he's in Hong Kong in Free to Choose, yeah. and he was very much for uh, economic uh, engagement with China and trade. Did he ever have second thoughts about that position? Um, 
or did he simply apply the same logic that economic freedom eventually would produce political freedom in China, uh, as it did in many other countries? Yeah, I think he was pretty still optimistic on China. And that's the example of Chile, right? Because Chile eventually transitions to a democratic system. And when he saw Tiananmen Square, he said, there's going to be more Tiananmen Squares. It's like the Soviet Union. Eventually, it will shake apart. So mostly, that's the, the approach he had. When he visited places like Singapore and um, South Korea, he did begin to think a little bit more about different types of freedom. So he has this whole, you know, there's economic freedom and political freedom, and they have this very strong relationship. Towards the end of his life, as he travels more widely in Asia, he says, well, maybe there's something called civic freedom, which is he's trying to recognize in some countries you can gather and you can speak your mind, and there's not a Stasi that's going to drag you off to jail and beat you, but you still don't have political choice. You still can't vote. And so he's kind of thinking about that in the, I think the context of Singapore and some of these other Asian city-states. And then he doesn't quite know where to go with this. It's like three types of freedom. It gets a little more complicated how they all fit together. Um, and I think that at the end of his life, he's seeing these really big changes. He's watching globalization in practice, and he has two worries about that. One is he admits that privatize, privatize, privatize was the wrong philosophy and that they really need to be institutions and the rule of law before you privatize. So he's, he's seen probably what's happening in Russia is probably on his mind. Um, and then the second is he's suddenly realizing the American worker, especially the American low skill worker, is now in a global competitive pool and is not going to fare very well. And that's why he shifts back to education mm -hmm. and feels like the American education system has to get much better. And for him, the only way that's going to happen is if competition is injected into the, the public school system. So, so I, it's interesting. One thought I had when I, you know, as I was researching this book, I sort of assumed he would become really fixed and set in his ways. And, and to some degree, that happens in the end of his life. But at the last five years or these interviews he's given, and he's very much like, well, I, I don't know about the monetary aggregates, or maybe I said the wrong thing about globalization. He's actually very reflective and quite humble and willing to say where he got things wrong. And so... I just always, in the book, he's responding to one piece of history. It's this kind of, you know, a Great Depression, World War II, Holocaust, Cold War. Like, those are the reference points. And then you see him in the end of his life moving into a world where they don't have those reference points and just kind of beginning to grope to what, how he would respond to that. And so um, we can kind of envision that, but we won't ever know. Well, I could talk to you for hours, and I <laughs> plan to after this event. But I would like to open it up to uh, the floor um, in the back there. Sure. Uh, just wait for the microphone, and then oh. if you could uh, put your comment in the form of a question, it'd be greatly appreciated. Yes. I promise I will put it in the form of a question, but I firstly have to say I do work for a Milton Friedman's Foundation, so I couldn't resist. I'm with that choice. Um, just have to say, love the title of your book, The Last Conservative. Uh, I know that he famously said he's not a conservative, but I would argue that he is, because I think in the, the, the uh, traditional American sense, preserving classical liberalism, I'm curious if that's how you came to your conclusion that he's a conservative, or if you could elaborate on how you came to that conclusion. Yeah, so um, I, I get, like I said, it has um, a kind of a pragmatic um, meaning in that this is the movement that he chose to ally himself with. Um, but I do think he was someone who wanted to make sure we didn't leave behind kind of what was already there and what was existing. Um, and I think he wasn't, he had a version of utopianism in the idea of what the market could do if set free. Um, but at the same time, I, I think he was worried uh, as with too rapid social change and too rapid social revolution. Um, that's not good for anybody in the society. And it particularly can be problematic for ethnic and religious minorities. So I think he always kind of had that in mind, that a certain sense of stability is necessary um, and to be a little careful with tampering with that. And just uh, to put a point on that, too. When the libertarian movement really moves against the Vietnam War in the late 1960s, early 70s, he doesn't, does, he doesn't really join that bandwagon, you know, does this he? Is, this is a fascinating episode. So he's very involved in um, pushing against the draft. Of course, yeah, really, he ends it. Essentially, really he ends it. Yeah. yeah, and providing this argument against the draft, which basically is we can afford to end the draft because we haven't priced in the economic loss of taking people out of their lives. But... I, someone email me if they find it. I could not find a stated opinion about the Vietnam War. Yeah. 
by Milton Friedman. He launches a public campaign against the draft and manages to not say if he is for or against the Vietnam War. And so I just think that was his strategy. Like, if I start talking about if I'm for or against the Vietnam War, that's all we're going to argue about. And I actually want to talk about the draft. But his son, of course, was very much yes. against the war. And, and so David is an anarcho-capitalist. And eventually, we'll, sometimes we'll get Freeman to like talk on the phone to these groups that are much more radical than he is. But Freeman doesn't think it, anarchism is not plausible. It's not realistic. It's not going to happen. And um, so as a result, he's considered sort of a court libertarian by some of the more uh, you know, anarcho-capitalists and, and more pure libertarians. So, so to the capital L libertarians, he was a conservative. Yes, exactly. So that's a, maybe another way in which he's a conservative. Depends uh, on where Maybe you one look. last question, please. Um, yes, Bruno? I just have the microphone there. Thanks. Uh, I want to go back to, you made passing reference to education on a couple of accounts. And for, that, that, for him, that meant vouchers. Uh, but that ran into some problems, as I understand it, around the segregation issue. But, yeah. You know, could, but at the end of his life, he and his wife come back and create the foundation, which is dedicated to education. So what's the through line there about the importance of education in, in the way he's thought about the world? Yeah, I really think it's about competition. And actually, the voucher idea, I think he got from John Stuart Mill, because I know he was reading John Stuart Mill, and there's like a throwaway line when Mill's like, maybe the government could give parents money. And I'm like, oh, like that sounds like vouchers. So he brings it, he, he pushes it to the fore in the early 1950s, and it's just kind of a thought experiment. But really, after he puts it out there, it becomes Brown versus Board of Education and this great desire to maintain segregated schools in the South somehow. And so a lot of people in the South jump on vouchers and say, this is how we're going to do it. If we have to integrate the public schools, let's use a voucher system and we can maintain segregation. And Friedman like hesitates for a minute about this. And then he's like, OK, I guess vouchers can be used in a variety of ways. And he says, I'm not a segregationist, but I'm, you know, I would, I would prefer um, that people make their own choices. but." Um, Vouchers can help them make their own choices. So it really gets tangled up in segregation. Interestingly, there's another history of vouchers, which is actually, um, you know, has a kind of left sources and including sources in the African-American community. They say, no, we want vouchers because it's community control. So there's a lot of different narratives about the history of vouchers out there. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it's later in his life when he's thinking more globally, as I said, about like how... Um, how is the American education system going to produce people who can compete? And I also think that the metrics of our educational performance go down from the 50s to the 90s, like the American educational system gets worse. Um, and that's when he decides we need to have, uh, this, is the, this is the silver bullet if we can get people better education. And he also has, he has a justice angle to it, which is right now what most inhibits your mobility in the United States is where you live, because where you live is tied to the quality of education you get. And if we could break that tie between residence and quality of education, we would really open the society up. So that's what he's hoping to do. I tend to think that, so you know, we're probably never gonna get the full-fledged voucher system Friedman wanted. There's also some evidence he thought we could just uh, eventually get to the point where there are no public schools, there's just vouchers. I think that that's probably not gonna happen and probably is not a good idea. But this, a lot of times with Friedman's ideas, it's a very pure idea and the dilution of it, nonetheless, is very powerful. So I think the dilution of thinking about competition, um, whether it's vouchers, charter schools, or even I think one of the latest moves is let um, within a district, let people choose the schools within the district or within the state that brings some of the competition that he thought was really the mechanism. Because there's no incentive to improve if you have a captive audience or you have a captive um, consumer base, let's say. Well, please join me in thanking Jennifer Burns.